Hello, I'm Nesim from the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung and welcome to Climate Crisis, Time for a New Society, a podcast series in collaboration with Verso and the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation Brussels. We are bringing together writers and activists to discuss radical ideas and actions to move beyond the doom of climate breakdown, pushing for the transformation we need for a new society to rise and flourish. Today, we are in Brighton for the World Transform Festival, and this episode was hosted by writer and journalist Dalia Gabriel. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first episode of this podcast collaboration between Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung Brussels and Verso. I'm Dalia Gabriel. I'm a contributing presenter at Navarra Media, and I'm also a co-curator of Perspectives on a Global Green New Deal, which is also a Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung supported publication. Uh, alongside uh, Harpreet Paul, who you'll hear from later in the, the episode today. So we are currently at The World Transformed in Brighton. We are sitting on a beautiful beach in a cloudy day with seagulls circling us in a way that feels quite quite threatening. Um, but it's it's beautiful to be out and, and together uh, in the sort of, you know, not behind our, behind our screens. In fact, The World Transformed is actually the first time that we've all been together since uh, the event that shall not be named. Uh, and it's been the first time that we can talk in person about how we build power uh, on the left in the midst of crisis. So that brings us to today, where we will be talking about the pathways through and out of climate breakdown in, in ways that build a more just and abundant world. Today's discussion will be with Matthew Lawrence, the co-author of the book Planet on Fire, a manifesto for the age of environmental breakdown, which he wrote with Laurie Labon Langton. Matthew Lawrence is founder and director of Commonwealth, a think tank that designs ownership models for a democratic and sustainable economy. And we will also be joined by Harpreet Korpal, human rights lawyer, PhD researcher and co-founder of Tipping Point UK. So how are you both doing today? Yeah, good. So watching out for these seagulls, but <laughs> otherwise well. <laughs> yeah, good, good. So the book was written six months ago, Matt. Um, and obviously, you know, a huge amount. It feels like it was a different world last time we were here in Brighton in 2019. What has changed since you wrote it? And how much of what is what you've talked about in the book has, you know, can be applied to the moment that we're in today? Yeah, I feel in some ways... Rather than there's been an acceleration and amplification rather than sort of like you know a st structural change from before. So you know, COVID is you know exemplifies a lot of the themes of the book. You know, this it emerged out of a sort of um, wider entanglement of capitalism and nature and the extractive dynamics that um, you know have driven that. And the book's kind of core argument is that environmental environmental breakdown is a sort of crisis of politics and power, and it's rooted not just in decades but sort of centuries of capitalist extraction and the dynamics of enclosure. Um, you know, commodification, exploitation of labour and nature that that involves. And really, I guess, you know, what we've seen is the intensification of those processes in the last, you know, year or so of the crisis, you know, whether it's, you know, vaccine apartheid, whether it's sort of, you know, huge explosion in wealth inequality, whether it's sort of, the, you know, the differential treatment um, in terms of, you know, access to loans for the global south, you know, on every stage of the crisis, there's been a reinforcing of the underlying dynamics that have, you know, created the crisis of inequality that you know, preceded covid but also, of course, you know, the inequalities of power and resources that have driven the climate crisis. Harpreet, what for you has, has, has the pandemic taught us about, first of all, how we respond to moments of crisis that affect our everyday lives, that cause us to retreat uh, away from sort of society? Uh, and and what, has, how, what has the sort of government response also told us about how capital and the state's Uh, is planning on responding to, to crisis like climate breakdown? I think Aaron Duty Roy said uh, almost days into many different lockdowns across the world that the pandemic is almost like an x-ray for how we can um, see ourselves in the systems that we've created. And I think when we saw, for example, the Indian state declaring a lockdown and a number of informal laborers having to suddenly walk thousands of miles home without any access to wages, for example, the kind of disproportionate impact on people that have left rural areas, come to urban areas looking for work in informal sectors and having no support 
um, in a crisis to be able to meet basic needs. And hundreds of thousands of people in those journeys um, home where they were trying to reaccess kind of community forms of support um, experienced extreme hardship and many people had had to leave those areas for climate change reasons too in, a, in addition to neoliberalism and economic um, factors but I think closer to home what we also saw was um, an expectation of states in, in the UK for example to um, enable workers to some workers to access furlough schemes types of things that governments in the global south haven't been able to do because of loan conditionalities and other kinds of regulation which restrict their space to be able to meet people's needs but at the same time also showed how states define work so while um, care workers um, that have been unpaid for a long time were expected to continue to do that work alongside doing paid work I think really highlighted kind of extreme hardship for a lot of a lot of people and I think one thing that has been quite interesting about how the the vac- how the the pandemic has has unfolded is that clearly this is a, a global crisis it's a that the virus does not respect national borders nearly as much as as we do and yet it has been the responses have been very much articulated through national governments in a way that has been very ineffective. So one example of that is seeing the hoarding of vaccines by global North nation states as if having, you know, an unvaccinated world population won't cause uh, the pandemic to accelerate and and mutate. How can we, what can we learn uh, from the lessons of the pandemic about connecting the local and the global in our responses and in the way that we narrativize our pathways out of these crises. And what especially can we learn about the importance of breaking out of the nation state as the primary unit uh, that we are sort of appealing to in these moments? The hoarding of vaccines is an interesting place to start because I think, you know, again, it's that sort of sense of the crisis of amplified pre-existing um, patterns of how we organise our societies rather than a, a break. Um, so obviously, you know, you've seen this extraordinary sort of moment where like this primacy of property and sort of property relations and you know, intellectual property in this, this form and the profits of big pharma have been put ahead of the, like, the, the needs of um, people across the world. And of course, you know, what makes it particularly peculiar and therefore it really reinforces the point that, you know, profit and property sort of... Um, take precedent over over lives and needs is that as you say sort of you know no one's safe until everyone's safe and so there's a, there's a you know even for the global north there's self-interest in in sort of delivering this and yet sort of it's uh, you know there's just been a complete failure on that and i think that sort of reinforces the need i guess to sort of um think in and through and beyond the nation state at the level of these deeper structures so like you know property relations would be an obvious one how do we sort of reimagine property relations not just in relation to the you know um, you know, COVID vaccines, etc., but the whole sort of complex of you know big pharma in the round. You know, what is you know where do we direct research and development to? Who has access to it? Towards what ends are we sort of like organising medical research and production? And you know, the obvious argument, we're sure the obvious um, case the left should be making is that it should be based on need, not profit. You know, this should be a sort of public good, not sort of uh, sort of a site of accumulation. Um, but that, and that obviously you know, requires organising far beyond just like the confines of the nation state. And I think you know, some of those, you know, in terms of the sort of narrative, there are, you know, whether it's you know, the crisis of care that's been so exposed, you know, the vaccine part of it, there are a series of moments, you know, ongoing moments in the crisis that are so acute and so like narrati- narrativizable, <laughs> if that's what, um, that I think there's an opportunity to sort of like you know, construct broad coalitions. Um, and it's, it's interesting, you know, the IP sort of situation there was, um, which again sort of reinforces the sort of, um, you know, uneven um, field of exchange and terrain of power in the global economy. But, you know, if you look at sort of some of the work that was being done at the WTO, sort of India and South Africa South delegations um, early in the, in the crisis, sort of organised, I think, up to 75 countries in the global south to sort of suspend some of the IP laws. And so you can kind of see like an emerging network of sort of, you know, transnational solidarity there. And I guess it's really a case of, you know, the global north catching up and, you know, those you know, living in the global north working much harder to break out of sort of those structures of power and profit that 
currently govern you know, the global economy. Interestingly, I think the role of grassroots groups in the US that have been able to force the Biden administration into um, a position that's more progressive than the UK is perhaps indicative of something that, that I think is perhaps lacking on this question of, of how UK grassroots movements are able to respond to this this question. I think it's a, a really, really crucial one of how do we not um, forsake our relationship to global communities while addressing kind of really real tangible housing issues within the UK, gentrification that's happening, air pollution that's happening. And I think it's something that we really need to dig deeper and to ensure you know our political context is is different and um, we're not dealing with um, anything remotely like the Biden administration here but I do think that a kind of grassroots focus of people power acting in solidarity in the ways that Matt has just started to outline is, is really crucial and crucial to kind of um, solidify in, in ways and I actually think that it's really hard to imagine responses outside of nation states, um, partly in, in the absence of um, ways of which we can connect within communities um, beyond that. And I think um, before we met, as we were getting coffees this morning um, at The World Transformed, uh, Dahlia, you were talking about something that's really quite unique in, in the Kurdish movement of a sense of community and, and coming together and that that exists beyond uh, the nation state, given that there, there isn't one. <laughs> and sure that there's, there's an element of that that's um, rooted in ethnicity, but... Um, those in the Kurdish movement would say that it that it transcends that too and um, that's really important to hold on to and I think how do we reconnect within our communities so that we're not just only using workplaces as sites of organizing but that we're actually speaking with neighbors people that are moving from very different narratives and ways of thinking and organizing meeting people's needs in communities and then making links as to how we've arrived at a system that gives us reason to, to fight for more in the UK, but also fight in solidarity with um, people that are helping create the things that we're using every day. And I think coming off that, you know, we are at the World Transformed, which for those who aren't aware, it's a sort of uh, festival that happens alongside the Labour Party conference. And the relationship between grassroots movements, social movements and the Labour Party has been a very fraught one over the past few years. Uh, there was a point at which there was much more dialogue under the leadership of Jeremy Corbyn, and that's that's, that's very much changed. So I think that that question of, you know, in the book, Matt, you, you speak about the necessity of building social movements, of concepts like mutual aid, community energy production, and yet at the same time, uh, it's very clear that we need to have very drastic action that is done at a short in a short amount of time, uh, and a scale of action that could probably only be taken on by the, the uh, only an institution currently that can take that on that exists is the state so in that context how what is the relationship between the state and social movements and how does that change according to geography um you know where you are located in the context of climate breakdown you know unfortunately social movements probably can't retrofit every single person's house um that is something that or build enough you know energy Re just reorganize our energy production system to 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 rely on renewables. So, in that context, what do you think the relationship between these social movements and community organisations should be? At its core, it's about building power and collective power. So, if the climate crisis is overwhelmingly a crisis of politics, you know, it's not a crisis of do we have the resources? Can we mobilise you know, the finance? Do we know how to decarbonise our energy? You know, it's not a technical challenge. You know, it's difficult, but it's not. That's not the the, the main barrier. The main barrier is um, our politics and the wider sense are organised around you know logics of accumulation and expansion and expropriation, and that's that's the sort of cord that has to be cut by mobilising power. And so, so social movements, you know, and you know, down the road from the Labour Party, but like social movements in some ways. Building power in and of itself, you know, in communities, you know, whether it's you know in neighbourhoods, in workplaces, um, you know, in and beyond just like just one rooted geography, 
that's you know and whether it's housing migrant rights there's just like an endless list of areas where we can we can we can and must be building um collective power that in and of itself seems to be should be a key goal um because i think you, you, you know you're right that in the states obviously you know there's a huge amount to be said there um and obviously you know the castle state and levels of violence etc there's, there's huge things that need to be sort of dismantled in how the state currently operates but at the same time given you know the scale of you know transformation we need and the resources that can but do need to be mobilized um you know the state is the actor that you know is can drive the you know can drive the scale of retrofitting or whatever it might be but i think to get that done you know you need to start by building power you know in place and then that might then in adjacent sort of forms you know shift more like parliamentary fo focused forms of um political activity like uh, like the labor party in the uk um but i think in some ways rather than focusing on you know the Labour Party is the object, much better to focus on you know, social movements building power and then that will then sort of necessarily create leverage in other institutions, whether it's political parties, whether it's the state itself. Um, and, and, you know, so I think it, and it's, it's that sort of dialectic and being you know, in, in against the state, obviously, but, like, you know, that is probably where, you know, um, we have to be. And I think, you know, again, sort of COVID is a stimulus for that because I think, you know, a lot of the sort of things that have really sort of um, sprung up with this mutual aid, sort of solidarity networks, et cetera, like reflect the type of impulse that we need to sort of, um, you know, accelerate and amplify. But yeah, it's a, it's a difficult question because <laughs> it's obviously like one of the sort of key political challenges and terrains to like sort of navigate, particularly post 2019. I think what social movements absolutely have to do is change what is politically tenable at the moment. I think that's partly, Matt, what, what you were saying around the role of social movements in being able to to drive the policies as well and at the moment we have a context in which um, as Matt says we've got available solutions yes we need um, huge resourcing for them we need political will to make them happen but the technologies of reducing our energy use um, and having that transition to renewable energy is absolutely possible available um, what we have instead to kind of political context in which we've got a UK government talking about net zero which is essentially predominantly around offsetting responsibilities maintaining a current level of consumption here and offsetting responsibilities um, by using land and resources in the global south and what social movements can do is build that power that Matt was talking about to change what is politically tenable to make what is absolutely necessary obvious in a way that it's not at the moment. It, the kind of scale of action that we need, I think, is regarded, um, even in some mainstream NGO circles, it's like untenable, unreachable because of the scale of what's required, what needs to change. And I think if we're starting from the perspective of building power in communities, what we're recognizing is that democracies are built to represent people <laughs> and if people are engaged in saying we need systems and structures that respond to our needs and not to the will of a small minority of people um, then absolutely we we can kind of create the politics that that can respond to the scale of our crises both of you have mentioned at some different at some points the sort of the care economy and the way in which that is often invisibilized in our idea of what the economy is and that and i think that what you know what we are currently living through with the pandemic and and what we will absolutely live through and many communities are living through with climate breakdown is the sense that you know when crisis hits not only does it become very apparent what labor is actually important and necessary you know when the rest of the world when everyone retreated during a time of crisis it was the nurses it was the domestic workers it was the care workers that had to go to work and also that, that when crisis hits and, and social breakdown occurs, it is care workers, predominantly women, uh, unpaid and paid, who uh, fill the gaps, who step in. They strategize around food and energy shortage uh, or insecurity. They look after, you know, the mental and physical well-being of, of their communities. And I think in many ways, in a lot of proposals around, even from the left, around you know, climate breakdown and a just transition, there is still this assumption that that exploited and unpaid work will continue and it's not uh, like directly addressed um, when we talk about things like work in a just transition or infrastructure in a just transition. 
what do you envision how do you envision the the role of you know a theory of the care economy as re as recentered in our notion of what the economy is how do you envisage that in your in your understanding of what our pathways are out out of climate breakdown I mean, I think care in some ways should be the sort of, when we, as we refound, uh, you know, the purpose, the orientation of the economy, the care should be the sort of root of it. And it, it care in an expansive sense, so, you know, sort of caring for, you know, um, both sort of human and non-human life and sort of the ecologies that uh, underpin everything. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things, you know, in terms of less gaps, I think also being, you know, being attentive to sort of like you know, global supply chains of care uh, and, you know, it's, it's, it's great to have, you know, well-resourced, decommodified, publicly provided you know care systems in the UK for example but if that's then sort of drawing in sort of um, you know very, very often like women of color from the global south to come and work here then that you know there's a lot of you know, interesting work looking at what how that then pressurizes and then intensifies um, some of the sort of gendered uh, divisions of labor in um, countries of the global south so I think there's there's a whole set of areas but I mean I do think you know that fundamental principle like care should be at the root of things it should be valorized it should be decommodified it should be sort of um, you know publicly provided it should be sort of taken out of sort of circuits of accumulation um so i mean in the uk there's been this um you know debate recently around um sort of social care, adult social care and there's a little you know there's a, you know, most of the political debate focused on okay well you know how are we going to you know fund this um you know, the national insurance contribution debate etc cetera, etc cetera. but there was no real sort of discussion of well actually like in the last you know, 15, 20 years, one of the most pronounced sort of changes has been the sort of the rise of private equity controlled uh, care provision, which has just been a transformative provision from majority of adult social care provided by not-for-profit and public uh, provision towards, you know, incredibly extractive, exploitative um, sort of economics of business models like providing adult social care. So I guess going, you know, how do you address you know, waged and unwaged exploitation, well, you've got to start by going back to sort of the structures of property relations that then drive and underpin how care is organised and provided um, and going back to those those root issues. Um, and really, I guess, you know, the sort of, you know, a sort of just transition should be about the meeting, you know, the meeting of needs, not at the expense of others. So, you know, it's not a just transition if you can meet the needs of citizens of the global north, but that's based on, you know, offsetting and land grabbing in the global south and, you know, global supply chains that, you know, in terms of care that are sort of deeply uh, unequal and extractive. Um, so I really, uh, you know, and care is like, the, as you say, like the most basic of needs. It's the thing that during the crisis, it was so acutely obvious that that is the foundation of, of everything. And so really it should be, a, you know, ordered as the first priority. And, it, you know, we should think about how do we adjust and how do we meet needs, like basic foundational needs for all and then expand from, from there. And so I think, um, you know, valorized, resourced, democratically controlled, um, you know, publicly provided, and um, sort of systems of care would be sort of foundation to that. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I also think that um, it's absolutely essential to do that if we're committed to trying to meet the 1.5 temperature <laughs> limit warming and modelling from Julia Steinberger and others actually shows that um, we only have enough energy to meet our needs whether that's housing, food, education, care, healthcare. And anything beyond what's serving a social purpose is threatening to kind of breach our temperature warming goals and exceed the current, current levels of resources that we have available. And so when thinking about this question, I think back to, to a lot of the things that Asad Rehman often says, that the, the solutions to a lot of um, climate issues are the solutions to a lot of other injustices, whether it's housing injustice, access to social care, access to education. Um, in order to meet the scale of our crisis, we have to focus on what we need and what's absolutely essential. And as Matt said, valorize that, put that at the center of everything. And isn't that beautiful that there's actually a kind of planetary boundary <laughs> around yeah. continuing it's I would have hoped that we could have got there without um, also <laughs> having the millions of people that are currently impacted by climate change but absolutely there is a physical boundary on being able to continue to expropriate accumulate profit over people and I think that um, 
the solutions to our housing crisis, to food insecurity, to racialized air pollution exposure, to to you know numerous other issues are the same solutions to the climate crisis and I think that applies to care as much as it does to everything else and when thinking um, about care in this context as well um, I'm also trying to center this idea of, of care for communities that are already impacted by climate change so while we're speaking as the festival's going on, there will be hundreds of people that are dealing with river erosion in parts of Bangladesh, for example, and potentially having to leave their homes or, or have property that falls into the river. There will be glaciers melting in, in parts of the Andes, putting people at flood risks. And so kind of expanding our notion of what it means to centre care and say actually countries and, and companies that have been historically res responsible for driving these emissions have a responsibility to make sure that people exposed to the impacts that they've done relatively little to contribute to um, are owned, that, that countries most responsible have a debt to pay and that is also a kind of component of care and repair that, that absolutely needs to be central to how we think about moving forward. Both of you are touching there on kind of visions of a world that is organised very differently and, and in the book, Matt, you, you talk about um, how a response to climate breakdown can promote communal luxury in societies of everyday beauty and comfort and I would just love to know what luxury means to you in that context is it is it Gucci for everyone or is it something a bit more meaningful uh, than that infinity pools <laughs> for everyone um, I mean so I mean it kind of builds off what Hopper was saying around sort of you know the public provision and the communal and sort of the democratic provision of of you know the meeting of needs and the expansion of capabilities, um, you know, whether that's, you know, the most foundational basic things like energy and, you know, um, housing and sort of secure dwelling, etc., through to, you know, having the resources, uh, you know, and that can be time and you know, it doesn't necessarily you know, have to be material resources, here, but having the resources to um, be the author of your own life and sort of be able to explore, you know, the full and varied capabilities that we all um, have within ourselves and then with others as well. Um, that is best met through, not through private profit-driven provision, but through, you know, collective provision. Um, and so I think, you know, there's there's two things, I guess, slightly segueing, but there's two things that I think are really important to sort of, you know, remember when we think about, like, how can the left construct sort of, you know, a sort of persuasive political strategy on, on you know, the climate crisis is that, you know, firstly, the solutions are solution that to the climate crisis also you know necessarily intersect with a whole set of other things because the climate crisis is you know all encompassing and they are much, the the left answers are just much more effective they are they really are how we need to do it and then the second thing that that responds to is you know um, which actually picking up on sort of um, something you mentioned but you know the most radical position is not the left's transformative program it's those who are content to sort of tweak with the status quo that is already you know the meteor has already struck for hundreds of millions of people but it's you know for those it hasn't it's hurtling very quickly and the sort of status quo you know like let's on the margins let's do a bit of offsetting here a bit of green capitalism there that is actually the most extreme position i anyway, know that's a bit of a segue but i mean on the on the sort of Luxury, yeah, I mean, it's not it's not like um, Gucci, though, you know, if, if you can produce Gucci in a way that, you know, is not exploitative in supply chains, etc., then, you know, I'm all for people wearing nice clothes. Um, but I think it is about that sort of a relationship. Um, and there's this nice line by Aaron uh, Beninav in his um, book, um, Automation, the Future of Work, around sort of abundance is a social relationship. It's, you know, it's not a sort of technical threshold. It's sort of how do we um, organise our sort of, you know, finite lives together in ways that, you know, are not built on relations of exploitation uh, and domination. Uh, and so luxury then becomes about, you know, having the security and capability to live together in ways that are sort of truly free and autonomous and can pursue um, our own ends, uh, but not at the expense of others. And I think that's the key thing that so, so many of the sort of like, you know, ecological modernization visions that you see presented are essentially premised on the exploitation of people and places elsewhere and so i think luxury has to be sort of communal in that sense uh, both for like you know being a sort of shared project of um democratization and sort of decommodification but also communal in the sense of like 
replacing private provision with collective forms you know public parks rather than private guard you know you can just go and go through the list you know public you know transport over privatized cars you know public provision of housing over so you know etc etc um so i think that there's those multiple senses of communal luxury um but yeah i think on, and on that like you know everyday comfort and beauty i think that the point is that doing these things and doing them well will actually enrich uh, and improve all our lives um so yeah so we should do it <laughs> yeah i i'm interested in this this notion of luxury having spent a bit of time thinking of <laughs> thinking about planetary boundaries and i think that that this does this concept does confront um finite level of resources that we do have and i think confronts a really important question that that needs to be addressed um we can't replace our current level of private car consumption with electric vehicles for example there isn't enough uh, raw earth minerals and metals available to do that we'd need just for the uk t- to make that replacement something like three times the current earth supply so it's not going to be possible to kind of imagine this future where absolutely everybody has access to a private electric car so i think redefining what luxury means in that context is really really important and i think redefining what it means to be in community in that context and designing architecturally uh, re-envisaging communities that are that are closer together where there's more time to connect with one another to pursue the things that make us feel alive rather than um be in the kind of bullshit jobs that people have to do and sit in traffic to to get to um as offices are are reopening and um so i think redefining what luxury means so that we can kind of have a, a more radical imagination of what it means to to live together in line with what's available on the planet is that absolutely essential and uh, we've been saying throughout this that we have all the technology to make that happen there are the, the heat pumps the retrofitting projects the renewable energy the um everything that we need to make this transition happen is available and at the same time what we have is a system that is luxury for a few where the majority of people struggling to meet very basic needs um in the book Dahlia and I co-edited uh, global perspectives on a green new deal um Hamza Hamishan for example talks about the fact that there's a solar plant in Morocco um where the energy is intended for consumption in Europe at the displacement of local communities at the intense water use of local communities so how do we define luxury in the global sense is a really important question we've got the wealthiest 10% responsible for over 50% of emissions while the poorest 10% the poorest 50% are responsible for less than 7% of emissions and they're the same people that are struggling with access to food with access to energy with access to secure housing so how can we have a global definition of luxury where equity is at the heart of access to the things that we need and the spaces that can cultivate a sense of freedom individually and and collectively is is absolutely essential so the book talks a lot about uh the need to build narratives that that can have a credible alternative vision and sort of coalesce people around these visions and we've seen narratives appear from various parts of you know the left but also you know the center there's you know the the green new deal which kind of comes from the climate movement there's just transition from the union movement What do you think do you think what do you think is missing from these narratives if anything and what do you want how do you think they need to be adapted or changed in order to meet the particular challenges of of especially a post pandemic world or a world that is still in the throes of pandemic maybe adding sort of a heightened element of antagonism to some of the narratives um in that you know there is embedded fossil capital which does stand opposed to the interests of the vast majority of people on this planet in terms of their you know, lives and livelihoods and well-being and i think you know that is kind of implicit in some of the sort of you know discussions around just transition and the green new deal but i think you know you know a bit of a many few few sort of like um dichotomy but re- re- resurfacing that and being like you know this is not just you know we're we're not all in this together you know and actually there are people who's whose politics whose economic sort of 
um, vision does stand opposed to life and making that a bit more antagonistic, you know, whether it's in you know, the sort of physical infrastructures of fossil capital and how we sort of engage with that, um, whether it's in sort of just like, just a bit more rhetorically like, you know, amplifying the antagonism in terms of the framing. Um, and I think obviously, because you, you know, you still need the sort of like, this is going to be great for everyone and communal luxury and, you know, flourishing and, you know, secure transition and sort of, you know, dignity for people in exposed, you know, sort of fossil fuel intensive sectors, but actually just being like, there is actually a sort of, you know, nameable and shameable sort of, so to speak, like core of embedded fossil capital um, that has to be, you know, disembedded and dismantled in short order. Um, and they show hitherto very little sign of, of um, being willing to be, you know, willing participants in that transition. And so I think that that element of the sort of the politics and the framing um, would be quite useful. And, you know, it's, it's pretty how, you know, the book has this you know, sort of quite short, but like little section on sort of um, <laughs> drawing inspiration from Margaret Thatcher, strangely, but sort of like, sort of like looking at how you know, the neoliberal revolution sort of like took root in the sort of 70s and 80s and sort of looking at some of her thing. And obviously what, one of the things she did very successfully was have narratives like full of antagonism, you know, loony left councils and like the trade unions, most obviously, and, you know, Brussels, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I suppose like a bit of that, you know, antagon you know, that sort of type of framing to go along with like the sort of smooth, sort of, you know, the, sh the, the stick and the carrot, the carrot being just transition, you know, sort of communal luxury, but the stick being like, hold on, there, there are sort of like um, identifiable political obstacles here that we need to be much more sort of aggressive in sort of like identifying and challenging. Um, so I think that that would be probably the thing, the one thing I'd add to the add to the mix potentially. It's nice to have the sun come out while we're talking about vision, um, and the seagulls suddenly look a little bit more elegant in the sun <laughs> rather than threatening. But um, I think within each of these narratives, there are huge distinctions, right? There, there are conceptions of a global green new deal that draws from you know over 31 contributors in in the book we co-edited for example that's very much rooted in in global justice and and decades long struggles for global justice and then there are green new deal narratives from brussels that are emerging that are kind of slight reforms from the system that we currently we have and I think there are similar kind of distinctions within the just transition narratives and I think yes we need powerful narratives yes we need kind of bold narratives that speak to what's at stake and what the scale of what needs to change but also I think for me visions that are a collective iteration in community is absolutely essential too and I'm thinking of the GKN um, Birmingham manufacturers that have voted to go on strike, for example, very recently they've been producing, I think 90% of their production is on uh, combustion materials for cars and, and they wanted to transition to EVs, electric batteries for electric cars and GKN with money from the UK agreed to, to do that but they've moved the jobs offshore and the workers at that factory have have decided to go on strike and they've been referring back to the Lucas plan from the 70s where in another factory in Birmingham workers um, wanted to move from producing military equipment to s products that were socially valuable and I think working in solidarity with workers outside of narratives whether it's a just transition or a global green new deal working in solidarity with communities actively trying to transition and finding solidarity and making links in those very local struggles to how they interconnect with the impact of the choices that we're making here in the global north as they manifest in the global south is absolutely absolutely essential and i think there are really interesting ways to do that um you know we were talking about what we need to dismantle and the financial industry that is pouring trillions into fossil fuel infrastructure is also the financial industry that's making uh, london impossible place for people to live and is driving a kind of gentrified landscape and so when we can connect the dots between the systems that are causing housing insecurity and driving the climate crisis and be able to speak to each other's struggles I think we can build a kind of movement beyond specific narratives of a just transition and green new deal and, and move to what's necessary.
And I think speaking to that, I want to end on on this notion of, of connection and being together. As I sort of mentioned at the beginning of this episode, this is the first time that we've been together as a movement in the UK for so long. What is the importance of, of events like this and moments like this where we are able to physically connect? And what is and how do we build power in context where we can't do that for whatever reason, whether it's because of a global pandemic or whether it's because of, you know, various other barriers to, to access? What, how do we build these kinds of connections at times when connection feels very frail and very fragile? Yeah, nice question to end on. I mean, in some ways, sort of one of the sort of perks of the pandemic i mean de- definitely not a perk but like the actual accessibility of zoom although you know, everyone got but like the ability to connect and sort of like to sort of really like minimize costs of you know gathering in place and all, all the challenges that presents was actually in some ways really quite a powerful and useful tool for organizing but i'm saying you know but actually gathering in place and sort of you know solidarity in person rather than just like via you know a computer screen um is actually transformative so, so i think um you know, sort of whether it's you know the, the tipping points of local groups through to you know the trade union organising, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think trying to sort of you know bring back the sort of you know human connection in sort of in physical rather than just digital spaces is actually really important to that building of power, building of trust, building of sort of um, shared solidarity. Um, and so I guess you know I guess we need sort of one, two, many TWTs and many spaces in which we can do that. While I guess being attentive to the fact that like. That will always, you know, in place events necessarily create you know, you know, lots of barriers and sort of um, hidden, you know, often you know, invisible challenges to who can attend, etc. But yeah, it feels like as we move into sort of a different stage of the pandemic, you know, it feels like it'll be a sort of real sort of reinjection of energy and um, a really sort of welcome <laughs> change. I was um, speaking to youth climate striker Lola Faikun, she was talking about the joy and connection of, of being at TWT implicit in the kind of the, the trainings and the panels and the, the, the songs and the different ways of being able to access the different spaces here. Um, and Ollie Armstrong from Breathe talking about how important it is to replicate that. And I think Breathe in, in you know, working class parts of um, the Midlands, where, where he lives, are talking about running workshops for young children on climate justice and providing care for parents and also spaces to come together to have a creative output on um, being able to express what it means for young people who are experiencing climate anxiety, for example, to have an, an output leading to coming together on, on the 6th of November for the COP26 Coalition's Global Day of Action for Climate Justice. And I think those types of spaces are absolutely essential coming to, to kind of replicate that way of coming together through singing or art or banner making for for the actions that, that are going to be necessary to show our collective power over the coming months and years. And I'd love to see more of that happening and people taking that spirit from TWT into into their communities to build that. And I think there are strong legacies of other movements doing that before ours that we should we should hold on to to the whether it's the um, uh, union movement in Detroit that was part of the black civil rights movement that provided breakfast morning clubs while workers agitated or um, political education in, in Sunday schools and Saturday schools um, the Caribbean community there's a kind of ways of working with the student movement with faith groups with community groups to be able to take some of that spirit um, and come together in joy and, and rest and agitation together. Matthew Lawrence and Harpreet Corporal, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been an absolute joy to talk to you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.